Welcome back, traders and investors, to Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep, brought to you by MarketFi. I'm Joel Elkanen, along with Brianna Valeski. And on the best morning show, we have the best hedge fund manager in the world, Reverend Emmanuel Lemelson, Chief Investment Officer of Lemelson Capital Management. Reverend, how are you doing this morning? I'm good, Joel. How are you? Uh, thanks for joining us, as always, here on Benzinga. Let's, uh, go, let's go right to the market here. Get your market thoughts here. Knocking on the door, all-time highs. Knocking really loud over the last couple sessions. Haven't been able to bust through. Are you uh, are you starting to take some longs off the table or put some hedges on, or you just think we're going to plow right through those all-time highs? Yeah, it's so hard to say, you know, Joel. And, of course, the, the wild card is always, uh, you know, inflation. And nobody really knows how far it will go. It's basic stuff, of course. It's Econ 101, but it's worth probably mentioning again. All these years of quantitative easing are sort of unparalleled, and, and even central banks don't really know where it's going to lead. So inflation is really hard to gauge in the long run. Inflation hasn't really been the CPI, the official CPI figure hasn't been really that high, especially core CPI. But uh, you know we'll see where it goes in the future. I mean, you always have to uh, adjust for money supply, and um, you know it's impossible to know for sure. But stocks are are productive assets, and and they inflate in value, and so. Uh, you know, if you own a few good companies and they're productive, they continue to be productive, and they're they're not radically overpriced or anything, and they have good management teams. Uh, it's okay to hold them. I mean, even if the market were to pull back, especially if you're not you know inclined to use leverage, you'd be just fine, I think, staying in the market. But be very conscientious that a vast majority of issues out there are not not cheap by any stretch of the imagination, and so you, you still have to look. If you have capital to allocate, be very judicious and where you allocate it. Uh, just so. looking at the market today, and I don't want to go too short-term on you because you have a real long-term perspective, but we did get those CPI numbers, a little bit of an uptick here, and they seem to be hitting the market on it. Is this, you know, just a, just a short-term aberration here, and the buy-the-dippers are going to come in, or are you looking at the data today as maybe a precursor of things to come? Uh, you know, r really hard to know, Joel. I mean, I uh, sort of the, the, the basic presupposition, I think, for any value investor is that in the near term, markets are, are pretty inefficient or can be pretty inefficient. And even over a medium term, you know, large groups of people can act in ways that are hard to understand and, and call rational. So you, you never really know for sure. I mean, every time I try to get in the business of forecasting where a price is going to go on an individual security or, or the markets, you know, I'm pretty much so wrong. So okay. I try to stay away from that activity. Okay. Uh, let's go on to the big dog. We'll start out with Apple here first. Uh, you know, had the dip down to 122 and kind of bounced back up, kind of bit in a, a trading range between, you know, 122 and 129. It changed. Fundamentals hasn't changed here. I, uh, you know, taking any chips off the table on Apple, selling some calls, buying some downside protection, or just sitting tight with your position. Yeah, still sitting tight, Joel. I think there's really two key data points, but before I get into those, I would just say that, you know, in the interest of full disclosure, our position is something like $25 million in Apple. And, uh, you, you know, they, they just haven't really extraordinary numbers. I mean, as you, as you recall from the Q4 conference call, they had sold about 74 million units. We, we had said prior to that current conference call in our interview with Benzinga that we thought they would be somewhere between 70 and 75 million units. That came out to about 74-plus billion in revenue. Um, you know, that represented a 30% increase in revenues, a 38% increase in earnings, and even more on an EPS basis, largely because of their buybacks, about a 48% increase in EPS. And they shipped a billion devices by November 22nd. Those are really extraordinary numbers. But I think even more importantly than that, Joel, the two things we can know for sure about Apple is that they're, the number of participants in their ecosystem is growing, and in large part due to defectors from Android. Two years ago, the meme was that Android and its various and sundry OEMs were going to spell the end of Apple. And it's almost the exact opposite of that now. What we're seeing is that people are moving away from Android into iOS. And what we know about iOS is people don't leave. I mean, you can't find a person with an iPhone in their hand, and you, you could just ask a stranger on the street, you know, are you happy with your, your iPhone? Are you happy with iOS? And you, you'll never get a no. So they don't leave. Um, and if you look at these sales figures for iPhone, uh, I don't know, Cowan came out with a report yesterday, something like, more than 25%, I think, had, had been new to the ecosystem. So as you contemplate, you know, the upgrade cycle, uh, these hundreds of millions of, uh, you know, iPhone users, uh, 
you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's just a giveaway on what the earnings are going to be in the future. I mean, it's probably one of the easiest companies in the world to forecast earnings on because of that. Uh, their extraordinary customer loyalty and customer satisfaction. And the other thing I would say is uh, it's pretty much so a guarantee they're going to increase their capital return policy probably, uh, you know, third week in April around their earnings uh, call. If this company continues to buy back shares, anyone that owns a piece of it, their pro, pro rata ownership stake in Apple will just increase automatically for free. So it's sort of like a tax-free increase in your, your equity position. And uh, my, my thought is they're going to probably increase the dividend. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty convinced of that. So you've got a company with a very healthy dividend, a really large share buyback, uh, almost a 100% guaranteed future and predictable revenue stream. Uh, and, you know, if you take cash out on an XP&E basis, you're still trading at a forward P&E of something like 11 or 12. It's not expensive by any means, uh, even when benchmarked against uh, any, any benchmark. So it would be really hard to think of a rationale to sell it still, even though it's had a tremendous run-up. I mean, we've made over 110% on the issue from our investment, uh, including dividends. But, you know, that, that in and of itself is not, um, you know, a sound argument to sell because uh, you really got to sort of try to figure out where things are going in the future. And there's just really no bad news. You know, people might say, well, iPad sales are declining. But I think if you look at the history of Apple, you would see that, uh, they really encourage almost internal cannibalization of their own product lines. And the thinking there is that it's better to cannibalize them internally than competitors. Are you buying an Apple Watch? Are you buying an Apple Watch? I bet you're buying that $10,000 gold one. <laughs> oh, no, if I buy one, Joel, it will be the cheapest one. The sport. <laughs> and even then, it will just be for market research. But... And the point about the iPads is that they weren't as high margin as these, uh, you know, phablet phones, these iPhone 6 and 6 Plus. And if you can sell even more of a high margin product than a low margin product, people, I shouldn't, shouldn't get too stuck on the whole iPad, uh, you know, upgrade cycle. So I think a lot of that's very deliberative on the part of the company. Okay. Uh, that next stock I want to talk to you about, um, I think this is the one that you said that uh, you should mortgage your grandmother's house and, and put money in it. And that was uh, Kulik and Sofa. K-L-I-C. Stock has moved up nicely. here. Ah, now we get a little bit of a consolidation here. Uh, you getting worried about this consolidation period or is it just another consolidation and move higher? Well, you know, again, Joel, just trying to look at what we can know and what we can't know. And, um, you know, as I confessed before, I'm just not smart enough to figure out the technical analysis, but I can figure out some of these things that are a little bit closer to second or third grade math. It's more in my IQ range. Uh, but uh, Kielke is an interesting company. I think people are scared by it because the management team on mass keeps dumping shares. I mean, the CEO of Bruno Gilmart, uh, just consistently selling off his shares down to 89000 It's not the ideal corporate governance structure. It's a stock issuance machine, and that's not right. But the fact of the matter is they're in a good business, and they've got a really sound underlying cash cow uh, business. So if you look at the current share price around 1630 about $8.20 is cash, actually. If you take that out of the share price, uh, you've got a forward P&E of something like under 7, I mean, maybe 6.8, something like that, just back of the envelope of math. And uh, even if you don't... Um, uh, take out uh, the forward, if you don't get the forward earnings, which we can estimate about 20% increase, something like a dollar eighteen a share, their current P&E X cash is still under 9, so about 8.5. So half the share price in cash, um, the underlying wire bonding uh, business, especially with copper conversions, very healthy. Uh, they, this new assembly on acquisition is probably going to grow at a compound annual growth rate of at least 10% a year. Uh, that's you know, that's going to add at least $100 million in revenue to the company. Uh, you know, despite management's perhaps poor choices and corporate governance and, and perhaps total lack of understanding, really, of, of the value of their own securities, uh, you know, it, it's really, really awfully cheap and a huge margin of safety. I mean, I almost look at Bruno Gilmart as the sort of Colonel Sanders of our time. I mean, Colonel Sanders, you recall, uh, when, he, when KYC went public, it was the largest fast food chain in the world, but he insisted on not keeping any shares. He just wanted cash. And uh, he would have been extraordinarily wealthy, of course, if he had kept those shares. So uh, it's a weird management team, but operationally, they, they do a great job, and the company has a very bright future. I mean, they're, they're, they're really addressing every aspect of advanced packaging technology now. They've got tremendous cross-sell opportunities with this new acquisition. So, you know, we'll probably see on the high end $145, $150 million, I think, in revenues this quarter. And we could see operating margins somewhere in the 25 to $30 million range, which it's, a, it's quite a lot for a company that size. Okay, so if you would have mortgaged your grandma's house and you put it in GEOS, 
geospace technologies. Grandma wouldn't be too happy with you. And uh, this... <laughs> well, I would say mortgage both your grandmother's house in the case of geospace. <laughs> uh, you know, that's just an incredible company in, in many ways. They have uh, really a management team that's above reproach. They're honest. They're down to earth. Uh, they don't pay themselves too much. And recently, that thing was trading at fourteen, I think fourteen ninety five a share. At that price, you were buying just you know cash and receivables and inventory. And I think the misunderstanding there is, you know, most people look at that thing and say, well, this inventory needs to be written down fifty percent. But that's that's actually incorrect. If you read the footnotes on the financial statements, they, they've been impairing that inventory regularly every quarter. So that one forty six number, it's under forty six million inventory. It's a good number. Uh, these things don't really become obsolete. Uh, you know, in a short period of time. And another thing a lot of people don't recognize is that most of that inventory is tied up in, in really raw materials or sub-assemblies, so not really even finished goods. You know, this is not a company-specific problem. It's really uh, it's an industry-wide problem. And it's not even a bet on the future price of oil and gas. Uh, you know, Joel, really what it is, is it's a bet that at some point uh, production and exploration continues. And I think, when again, looking at what we can know versus what we can't know, uh, all you really need to look at is uh, the supply and demand equation uh, because oil is a commodity and it's subject to these forces. And it's interesting, but uh, if you look at just the case of two, major, uh, two oil majors, BP and Shell, BP is only replacing about 65% of what they're shipping. And in the case of Shell, it's about 25 26%. Um, this is the lowest in over a decade for these companies. If you look on the demand side, the IEA is still reporting that energy growth needs are going to continue to grow at about 2% a year through 2025. You know, at that rate, I mean, at the rate OPEC's going and, and all these other owners, they keep you know, shipping off the shelf uh, what they've already produced and not replacing it with new reserves. It's just not sustainable. I mean, it has to change at some point. So when you're looking at these companies, uh, especially really these smaller companies that operate in the, the E&P space, uh, they're subject to this tremendous volatility with this collapse in the price of the underlying commodity, but you're not even betting on a future oil price. I mean, whether oil's trading at 60 or 70 uh, in the third quarter of this year or if it's trading at 50, uh, I'm not convinced it makes much of a difference. I, I think all that matters is do you believe uh, exploration will have to continue at some point? And then what you've got is you've got really a small company that's well-run with leading technology and really the only company that isn't in direct competition with their customers providing you know, wireless nodal systems. <clears throat> you know, that's really important. No, no uh, debt, a very large cash cushion. Uh, you know, it looks awfully safe in my mind. So, you know, we point, continue to be aggressive buyers of that issue. Is there a point uh, where you would say spoke, uncle? We, we've increased is there a point where you would say uncle in this thing? Uncle? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, Joel, I actually think there's further downside potential, frankly. I'm not convinced that the, the current recovery in price in the last few days is sustainable. I, this company's out of covenant with their, their lenders. I mean, they have 100 million liquidity, but 50 million of that's from lines of credit. You know, lenders in this industry are awfully skittish right now, and for good reason. Uh, I think if a few, you know, things were to happen, like their credit line were to be pulled or something like that, which is plausible, I think people would get really scared again. Uh, frankly, I hope that happens, because at current prices, we're really buying the company's long-term assets for free. I mean, it's like going to a bankruptcy liquidation without the bankruptcy. <laughs> I mean, we're getting the land and the buildings and all the machinery and all this. It's really state-of-the-art stuff, intellectual property, and a superb management team, uh, totally for free. So I hope some more bad news comes out uh, between now and, you know, later this fall, because uh, it would just present more of a buying opportunity. Okay, sticking with your conviction. Uh, you still got your one share WWE here. They have a conference coming up. Uh, stock is... A little bit of consolidation here after sprinting over seventeen dollars. You're you still holding on to that one share. Is there anything you know? I mean, I know you've played this from the long side. I know you played this very successfully from the short side. Um, it's just just a hands off issue here at sixteen sixty four. Is there something you know that would make you get back on the other side of the market? Yeah, I don't think we'd get back in, Joel. I mean. Uh, it's important to note WWE's revenues, you know, they've increased recently, but they've only re really recovered to where they were at in about 2008. That's to say there hasn't really been a material gain in revenue for over seven years. And net income has had a pretty steep decline over the last five years, and, and partly because of uh, eroding operating margins. And the result has been that since year-end 2006, owner's equity has been halved. 
And I think what WWE is today is it's really a good case study in corporate governance again. And they're really moving in the wrong direction. So typically where you have a financial showing of this variety over a number of years, you know, the board would start to ask questions, what's going on with leadership. In this case, there's two problems. One is the board is anything but independent, uh, especially with the new additions, which it's literally family. I mean, it's bad enough when the CEO and the board, you know, play golf every weekend together. But when it's family, you've got an issue of independence. But the second thing is that, you know, you've got this uh, controlling class of shares, and that really sends a message to shareholders that, look, uh, we'd be happy to take your capital, but we don't really want to involve in the business in any way. And um, I think shareholders need to be sort of aware of that. Uh, you know, the corporate governance structure starts to look a lot like a mom and pop ice cream shop after a while. And where is the safeguards for shareholders? It leaves them awfully exposed. So, you know, we have these, these corporate governance best practices for a reason. Uh, they're totally absent in the case of WWE. Uh, again, I'm, we've always maintained our position that the underlying intellectual property has great value, but, uh, you know, it would be very difficult to unlock uh, with current leadership. So uh, our position would be the same. Unless there was a change in leadership, uh, you know, that value is not going to be unlocked. I mean, you, you, you have an unsustainable financial situation. The dividend is really legitimately a risk. Uh, it couldn't continue like this for another five years. I mean, the company would be totally insolvent. So that, that's important to recognize. Are you still keeping your one share short in Legan Pharmaceuticals here? The stock is uh, caught a bid, uh, got over $78. I know you had a successful short position in it, but you covered all from one share here. Um, are the Are the fundamentals still there? Are you thinking of uh, maybe re-entering that short? Well, you know, Ligand's an interesting company. I, I swore off shorting after shorting Ligand, and we covered around 43. It was, it, we had shorted the company around 68, and we wrote all these reports, and it was a lot of work and all these things, and all the, you know, things that happen when people publicly short a company. And uh, But, you know, reading their most recent or, you know, earnings release, they just continue sort of this pattern uh, that we think is really, you know, without wanting to be too negative, uh, probably not an accurate portrayal of things that are really going on at the company. So I uh, just couldn't, we couldn't help ourselves, Joel. We had to short the company again around 76 and a half. And, uh, you know, if you read their most recent earnings release, they'll, they'll come out with headlines uh, like total revenues increased 56% and royalty increase, uh, revenues increased to 32%, net income increased 278%. I mean, these are impressive percentages. You look at it and you go, wow, this is amazing. This is, you know, a dynamic, growing company. But then, you know, these are non-GAAP measures again. So when you start to look at the GAAP measures, you find out that between 2013 and 2014, EPS only increased one penny. And during that time, uh, shareholder equity in one year was cut in half by 50%. So, you know, that's extraordinary. I mean, because that's really what's buttressing uh, the shares. I mean, that's your security interest in the, in the stock is your, your equity. That's what keeps you from, you know, bankruptcy and, and being written off. So, but during that time, the reward uh, for management was extraordinary. So uh, they paid themselves a, a, over 100% more than they did in 2013 uh, through stock options. And they do a great job of keeping this out of the headlines. Um, but as far as... You know, we talk about corporate governance and Kulik and Sofa and WWE and Ligon. You really almost have three tiers. I mean, you have Kulik and Sofa, which is almost um, almost innocent. They don't, they're selling, but they're doing a great job operationally. They, they're, they're actually hurting themselves by selling uh, their own shares that they're issuing, but it's not egregious issuance. Then you've got WWE, which has total control. It's not really a, a public company, per se. It's public money, but it's private control. And then you've got a situation with like Ligon, which is sort of the most serious offender, where... They're, they're saying one thing publicly, and they're sort of doing another thing you know, privately. If you read the SEC filings, they're very different than the press releases. And you just got to look at the real financial metrics. I mean, the company's you know, highly leveraged now from very, very expensive debt. You know, EPS is going nowhere. Owner's equity is eroding at a rate, again, totally unsustainable. At this rate, you know, within just a few years, you would have no equity again. The company be, just became solvent last year with a very small margin. And then you've got enormous stock issuance to, to just a few individuals. Uh, you know, you've got a $1.5 billion market cap company with something like 18 employees, and really the top two guys are making enormous, enormous amounts off, off this. So what happens is you have a company that's really geared towards more marketing its own stock because as the price of the stock goes up, management does very well. Uh, but the underlying business uh, is not doing well, and it really never has. So the result of its entire lifespan is an enormous deficit. 
And so yeah, I think people buy these things with sort of like the way you'd buy a lottery ticket, you know. And but anyone who knows about handicapping the odds of winning the lottery would know that it's very risky. So if you invested anything more than a dollar, like you put in a lottery ticket, you know, you might have an unhappy outcome with like and would be my thought. We got a, we got 30 seconds left here. I want to cover two stocks, 15 seconds each. Uh, the first one, uh, Herbalife, uh, had a big short covering rally here. Uh, any take on Herbalife? I think there's a lot of merit to Bill Ackman's report. He spent a lot of money. Uh, I think he spent over $50 million, uh, in his investigation. I think it's worth, if you're going to invest in that company, at least watch his report first. Okay. Uh, there's a lot of speculation in both directions. So. Okay. Lumber liquidators. Right. Lumber liquidators. Getting holding in here at twenty eight. I know you came out with your article. Twenty eight dollars, twenty eight thirty and change. Buy, sell, or hold. Lumber liquidators. Uh, stay away. We've been consistent. Stay away. Uh, the really unfortunate thing there is that all parties involved have been discredited at this point, uh, from uh, Tilson to uh, CBS, uh, and unfortunately, uh, even leadership in lumber liquidators could have handled this better. The, the number one priority is the safety of consumers, and everyone has put that as a backseat, uh, unfortunately in, and apparently in the interest of profit. So and there was never a margin of safety in lumber liquidators, not at 100, not at 27, uh, if you're just looking at the financial showing. So my thought is, uh, you know, stay away. Okay, Reverend Emmanuel Lemison, Chief Investment Officer of Lemison Capital Management, one of the top hedge fund managers in the world, joining us. Thank you very much, Reverend. We'll talk to you again soon. Real pleasure being with both of you, Brianna and Joel, and thank you so much for the invitation.